famous lady. Uh, you'll know a little bit more about her before she speaks. Um, Kerry is a gerontologist. She is a professor in geriatric medicine. She is also the director of the Elder Abuse Forensic Center um, at UC Irvine School of Medicine. Um, Kerry is, Kerry's research includes work on optimal aging, the medical forensic aspects of elder abuse, and spirituality and aging. Before joining UC Irvine, she was a Congressional Fellow with the U.S. House of Representatives Select Committee on Aging, where she specialized in elder abuse and fraud. She is the co-founder and director of the nation's first elder abuse forensic center and chairs the social justice movement, Ageless Alliance, which you'll learn a little bit more about today as well. Um, Kerry is a frequent public speaker and lecturer. I, in fact, had the pleasure of um, speaking uh, with uh, both Kerry and uh, Dr. Laura Mosqueda at the uh, recent uh, South Orange County Senior Summit, and I sure tell you, we were one funny team uh, when we played. Ha didn't even know what any of us were going to talk about, but at the end it all meshed beautifully together and we just had probably more fun than even the people in the audience, I think, at the end. Um, Dr. Burnight received the 2011 Senior Care Humanitarian Award for Outstanding Administrator of the Year for her work in detecting and addressing elder abuse and neglect. She was honored by U.S. Attorney as the recipient of the 2011 Award for Professional Innovation in Victim Services. And the big news you need to know is, uh, Carrie was on Dr. Phil. <laughs> so, there you go. Say no more. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, a good friend of mine, Dr. Kerry Burnight. All right. Well, whatever about all of that. I, you know, am lucky enough to get to speak at a lot of different things. And when I came in today, I felt nervous because this is my dream that these vibrant, accomplished, brilliant people taking charge of their life and their aging who know, I mean, who could any of you could get up and teach it today? So I think that's why I thought, gosh, talk about preaching to the choir. So because of that, I did it in a little bit different format because you're already doing these things. Um, I, I did a handout because sometimes afterwards it's nice to to look back on it, but I'm not going to just go down the list. So some of the things we'll cover on that list, some that we won't. And I also made some slides, but I think all of you have seen so many PowerPoint presentations, and sometimes it feels like, oh, how many slides left do, we have, do you have to read to me? So I tried to make it largely a discussion, and I would really welcome an interactive discussion as well. Um, so the topic is longevity love and legacy and I think it's the very most interesting part of life and people sometimes would say to me okay I understand you're a gerontologist but you know optimal aging and elder abuse don't you have pretty disparate research interests and in fact it's exactly a continuum so there is this continuum of optimal aging and then at, a, at certain points you know, lacking respect, lacking the things that you need, being treated too roughly. It's just all a continuum that we're all on so that any of us can become and fall victim to being um, a victim of elder abuse and neglect. And in fact, what I've seen is that any of us too could be a perpetrator of elder abuse and neglect. Um, so I want to talk about both of those things. So does it, to me, it sounds like I'm really loud does it sound like that to you? <laughs> okay. It's okay? All right. I could back off. My husband says that. <laughs> okay. So is that a little bit better back here? Sounds better to me, too. Okay. Back off. <laughs> okay. So we're going to first talk about the three things today I divided into longevity, love, and legacy. So longevity... Again, you already know it, you're doing it. I'm gonna to touch the bases basically so that you can check off, gosh, I am doing those things. And um, I want to introduce you to someone who's gonna go on our journey with us. So as we're talking about physical, I have a picture of these fellows and the guy with the very, very skinniest legs in the world is my dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And I was lucky enough to not only be interested in gerontology, but to get to watch my parents, who, like you, astounded me. And my dad has passed away, but my mom um, is continuing to astound me. And my dad is with me so much still. And so when I was thinking about legacy, and I thought about how strong he is to me and so many people, I just wanted to include him. So when we're talking about body, we can be looking at these handsome guys. And I know most of them, and I was thinking for some lecture, I'm going to go through each of them, because they've all had such interesting ups and downs in their lives. But for now, we'll just introduce you to John. Um, in terms of body, exercise, that you all, I got to see your amazing pictures. And the way that I think about it is FEBS, of flexibility, endurance, balance, and strength. So making sure that you and your portfolio are doing all those kinds of things. And as I'm sure you know, that it is one thing to know it, and it's another thing to do it. So to really, even if you've considered yourself an exerciser, every once in a while to take a step back and write down you know, what you've been doing, because sometimes it can surprise us in a negative way, like, actually, no, I haven't been doing anything for my balance since I stopped taking that class that I used to take. So keep doing what you're doing under Dr. Rose's amazing, I think anywhere in the nation, this is the place of exercise and aging. Also with your nutrition, I did a little survey of what you all selected and I did notice that the salad bowl was all the way down and empty. So you, you passed the test on that one. And never underestimating what it is like um, of filling yourself full of the fruits and the vegetables and unprocessed food. Um, the alcohol component, this time of year, it's always good to take another reminder of that, that what we used to drink and what we drink now is a pretty different story. And uh, another thing about my, whoopsie, he's gone, um, about my dad is he's such a straight-laced guy, went to a Christmas party in his 60s when he was the CEO, had a couple of drinks, and then drove home and got a DUI. So it's just such a reminder to us that it is a very real possibility that we would do much worse than a DUI, and that is an accident that would kill other people. So even though we know it, it's again one of those things of saying, I know it and I'm following through. I'm either going to get a ride home with a friend or I'm not going to drink at this one since I know I'm the designated driver. Okay, so in terms of a quarterback, important that you feel like, with a show of hands, who feels that they have a physician in their life who knows them and that they know and that you, they know what's going on with your other physicians as well? See? Okay, see with a normal crowd, there'd be just about no one. So I'm so glad that it's everyone. So it could be your family practice doctor, it could be your internal medicine physician, or it could be a geriatrician. Anyone here not know what a geriatrician is? Okay. He's, he's probably messing with me. <laughs> so we're just in the exact same way that we took our kids to a pediatrician, that to go to a geriatrician who really understands aging. I had someone I was working with recently, and she said, you know, that she went to the doctor and told her family practice doctor that she was concerned about her lumpy breast. And the doctor said, well, you're 92, that happens. And she brightly, right in his face, said, you know, this breast is 92 also, and it doesn't have any lumps. <laughs> <laughs> and in that instance, she was right. You know, she was right. She got the attention that she needed and um, was able to prolong her life through early detection. So make sure that your doctor gets it, and if they don't, get a different doctor. Um, sleep. Um, how many of you are <coughs> troubled with some sleep disturbance? Sometimes. Okay, and so I'm sure that you guys address that too in terms of exercising and getting enough sunlight in the day. Um, can really help with that, and I've seen some terrific non-pharmaceutical methodologies that it that it does exist out there. And then we're going to talk more about advanced directives. Raise your hand if you have an advanced directive. Okay. Now raise your hand if you've told all your kids or other people close in your life about your wishes. Okay. 
and multiple kids, not just the one that would be receptive to it, but the ones that would drag their feet about that stuff who that open-minded kid will have to contend with. Okay, because we're going to go back to that part of it, because I think your legacy is, I think that's a big part of your legacy. All right, so you're doing it. Because the thing is, you can't have age well if you're not around to do it. So we're just starting on the ground floor. I want you to be not dead. Okay. So you're not dead, and I'd like you to be as aware of your not deadness as you can. So um, we know, and society tells us all the time, that there's a decline in retrieval speed, and you've maybe noticed multitasking. I'm only 44, and I'm already noticing some difference um, in my multitasking abilities. And what is not as highly publicized, um, and yet is research-based, is the fact that um, not only do general intellectual skills persist, but in fact they are compensated by other areas such as wisdom, experience, and creativity. Now, oh, there is, I'm going to give you an example of this. My colleague, Dr. Cohen, from Harvard has parents in their 90s who visit him all the time on the subway. He was late giving a lecture. It was pouring down snow and he was not there to meet his parents, both who didn't drive. So they're standing out in the snow. They look over and they see a pizza place. They go over to the pizza place, they order a pizza, and they said, when you deliver it, take us with you. Okay. okay, so what this is, is a very real, very exact example of what we as older adults possess. And that is a creativity that doesn't decline. So research on creativity and aging shows this all the way up until death, an increase in creativity that is experience-based. We think, why did I not think that? It's because society has a multi-billion dollar industry telling us that it is a failure to age, that you are less than as you get older, that you're less attractive, less creative, less every, everything. And yet research is not showing that. So I think that if we can remind ourselves yeah, I'm not as quick to do certain things, and I can't get that my next door neighbor's name right now. But recognize that on the other, that the big, big picture stuff, and that if we could tap into that experience-based creativity as a nation, I think it, we would it would blow us away. And I think it's never going to come from younger adults recognizing it. It has to come from older adults kind of standing up for yourself and saying, you know, like going for it, of offering solutions and not letting that daily barrage of you are less than uh, get to you. Are there any questions or comments about that? Okay. So now we're turning to love. Talk about a big topic. I sat down and I thought, man, you know, how does one slice love? But I, did, I put it for today's topic um, in a way that there's research on social connection, on service, on spirit, and on faith. And I invited my pop along again. So the first one is about social connection. Here he is. And um, what we have found in the literature on elder abuse is that social isolation is a killer. And it's a killer for a number of reasons. One is that a lot of times perpetrators are looking for opportunities where there aren't other eyes on it. So what is the group that is the biggest perpetrator group in elder abuse? You shout it out. Who, like what kind of people are the biggest? Okay, you're 
Okay, I heard, I heard a lot of good answers, and then I heard most, most commonly the correct answer. 90% family members. Okay, so what happens is, we have three kids, like my folks did. Two of them launch and do their thing. One of them, maybe not so much. So when your spouse dies, the one who has had a harder time, maybe doesn't have a family, doesn't have the same kind of job commitment, that's the one who goes, or maybe even the other kids will say, oh, you know what, maybe Johnny can move in with mom. Oh, huh, okay. So then Johnny, who, ha who has a tough time to begin with, is moving in with somebody with a full bank account, somebody maybe who has some increased confusion and in cognition, and then she says, here, Johnny, grocery store? He's not a bad guy. He's like, okay, I'll go. You're at the grocery store. Huh. I can get anything I want. In fact, look at all these gift cards. I can get that. Oh my gosh, I'm going to get a whole bunch of Johnny Walker. Before you know it, not only is he he's going on it with his, but also all his buddies. So you have his buddies moving in. And it, a lot of times, that, I am getting back to social isolation. But then, as he's getting a little worried about the brothers and sisters knowing what's going on, then, Mom's fine. No, you don't need to come visit. We're good here. We're fine. And then he would say to the mother, yeah, those other kids are not visiting you. They don't want to come. They're really busy. I'm here for you. And so the mom starts to think, yeah, you're the one here for me. The one who has drained $300,000. The one who is back to using meth. The one who, you know, and so social isolation not only is empowering and fun and joyful and you are doing that, but it's also protective. So it's as important as anything else. And so if you kind of look at your social portfolio and realize, man, I have invested all, you know, we talk about diversifying our economic portfolio, but we've got to diversify our social portfolio as well. Because if all your friends are just your age and your peer group, right, when they pass away or have some cognitive impairment, so it's having people of different ages, knowing people well in terms of when you form new friendships. I see that a lot too, is that people will form a, a new friend, and you've got to be very careful in making sure that that new friend is somebody who also has your best interest. Um, we have countless, you know, in Orange County we have 800 reports of elder abuse every month, and for every one that get reported, 23 don't get reported. So if I had a dollar for every time an older man just fell in love with the 23-year-old who then took all his money, you know. And the women are all laughing, but it happens the other way too. <laughs> um, okay. You're also going to want to think through frequent role scenarios. So it is Either your, your odds are you at some time you're going to be taking care of somebody or that you're going to need care for it. And sometimes we don't think about those things and we act like it's a surprise. But if you really try to take some time and imagine, gosh, hmm, if after 85 statistics show us that 50% of people have cognitive impairment, what if, it, what if it's me? How will I do that? Which of my kids will I lean on? Or how will I put things in place beforehand so that I'm, and it's not, you know, it, I always say, it's not dark to talk about that or it's not inviting trouble. I think it's just going into it eyes open. Like, I want to make the very best of this time in my life, but there is a good, there's a 100% odds that I'm going to die. And there is pretty good odds that at some point in my life I'll have some kind of cognitive impairment. And I can proactively set things up that way. So, um, and then also recognizing that you're, what you're doing now is the greatest thing ever because you're learning, you're exercising, you're eating well, you're laughing, you're connecting with others. So again, preaching to the choir. Okay, service. Um, there's my dad, and his thing was mentorship. He grew up really, really poor in LA, and he, his greatest joy was when young guys would come in and he would say, 
he would talk to them about his career path and then he'd say at the end let's go get you a suit <laughs> and he would go and buy the young man a suit and you know he he just he just gave him joy and I we none of us knew he was even doing that and so at his service I had all these really successful businessmen come up to me and said your dad bought me my first suit <laughs> and I think what a, what a really interesting way that every single one of us can show our love through something and a, like a big one is just the time that you spend there's the most popular woman that I know is in a, is in a um, skilled nursing facility and she's unable to speak but she's cognitively intact and when she listens to you she is so there and I always think of her her service is her true listening and that people recognize it and it's not just because but my husband goes, yeah, well, she can't speak. <laughs> you know, it isn't that. It is that she's so connected with people. So it doesn't cost any money, and yet she's just this beloved, valued, um, life-changing person. So it would, I bet you all are doing a service that is meaningful to you. But if you're not, or if you think you want to do more, to just brainstorm it out, to think, this is what's going to, at the end of the day, when I look back on it. And it can be things that people know, or like my dad did, things that people don't even know. And I suspect that he didn't tell anyone because I think it would have made my mom mad. <laughs> you know, with like the resources. I think he was like, somehow secretly doing that. <laughs> okay, now I want to talk about spirit. Um, this, is, this is us laughing. Um, we have done a great job in psychology in looking at the negative. So we, we know a lot about depression, we're good on schizophrenia, we've really researched these areas. But the question is, is that not half-baked? If depression is real and worthy of academic study, then isn't joy as well? I mean, is it somehow less than to look into joy, to look into laughter, to look into forgiveness? So happily, um, Martin Seligman at Penn um, had that thought, and he was president of the American Psychological Association at the time. They got over a million dollars to get together some great thinkers, and that they created an equivalent to the DSM-4, so a, a, a grouping of systematically trying to understand what they called ubiquitous virtues within all religions and different schools of thought, are there virtues that are real and that are something that we could study? And of course there are. So, let me see if they're big enough. I think so. So what they found is the ubiquitous virtues, there were six. And then underneath, those are called the strengths, that are the variables. Because wisdom is too big of a um, conceptual construct to just say, you know what, I really am going to increase my wisdom. It's not a, it's too big. So they broke wisdom down into curiosity, interest in the world, love of learning, critical thinking, ingenuity, social intelligence, and perspective. And what they found, all that they broke it into, could be systematically increased. So I thought that was really encouraging. I had a guy who was really having a hard time with aging and he sat down with me and he said you know something I have two PhDs I have four successful children more money than we could ever spend they've been married for 60 years I'm bored when I wake up in the morning don't say I'm depressed I already go to a psychologist I already take antidepressants I'm just telling you this aging thing isn't for me I've done it all there's one of those work days where you're kind of okay let me think. And I was so lucky because I had just read of this about the ubiquitous virtues. So I was able to pull it out of my briefcase and say, that is so awesome that you've already mastered all of these. And so I popped down the list and you started looking down. He's like, well, I didn't say I'd mastered all of these. And I said, well, really, when you're just, someone is describing someone, aren't those the things that are really left? It is those virtues and strengths. So when I talk about my dad, I am not going to start with you know, things I can't even think of now. Yeah. But I am going to say, he was hilarious. And he was a mentor. And he loved to learn. And he was generous. And, you know, had a lot of integrity. So I think that 
opening our mind to those kinds of things, whether it's through your faith or through, you know, he was a man who didn't have faith in his life and he wasn't, well, you know, didn't want to. And yet even on an academic level, he could work on these ubiquitous virtues. So if we name them out, they're wisdom, courage, love, justice, temperance, and transcendence. And I think that's a lot of what we're talking about today is the transcendence part of it, the appreciation of beauty and excellence. And so when I was looking at your pictures, I think that, that's what that was capturing, all those beautiful sights and those new things and those amazing giraffe and those hilarious kittens of gratitude, of hope, spirituality, forgiveness, humor, and zest. Um, I have an exercise that I do. It's extremely simplistic, but I have uh, um, adults that I'm working with. I'll sometimes say, you know, just like this guy, I'm having a tough time with this. And so I had a, a lovely woman who is in her late 70s, and she said, she was telling me about the aging process and about what she's going through, and it was very real, very tough stuff. And I said, why don't you write down all the things that stink about aging? She's like, I would be happy to. And she had no delay, so she wrote down a big, huge list. I said, good, okay. Now fold your page in half, and on the other side, write all the things that are good about it. And so she kind of, okay. So it's more slowly, but then she did get to some doing. And so she, um, I asked her if I could share it with you today. And um, what she said she didn't like about aging is that her beloved's passing leaves me lonely. Names tend to elude me. I'm sometimes discounted. And then she had really lovely writing, and it, it looked like she had written the baggage. So I was trying to say, the baggage? And she goes, oh no, honey, that says the saggage. <laughs> <laughs> Which we all know what that is. <laughs> and it does bug us. <laughs> Next she wrote, knee pain. And as a result of knee pain, her gardening was out the window which was something she loved to do. Driving at night, no longer possible. Sleep is harder at night, and then she wrote, though naps are big for me. And then she wrote, doctor's appointments are time consuming, comma, all consuming. So then when she turned her page over onto the other side of the page, um, she wrote, I am free to be more candid. I'm more accepting of others. I have connections and friendships that are more appreciated. I no longer have to compete. Kids see that I'm more than a pancake maker. I'm more reflective and spiritual. I'm perhaps more mindful in the present moment. I have accomplishments and successes to look back on. I do get bursts of creativity. I'm stronger at the core, having survived this adversity. That was so beautiful. And that it gets me every time that every single one of us has both the left-hand side of the page and the right-hand side of the page. So sometimes I read things that are very Pollyanna about how it's just so great to be older. And I think that was written by a young person. Because <laughs> you know? it's not that easy. It's not that easy to lose a spouse. It's not that easy to lose an adult child or to you know, be, you just think you got over cancer and then the doctor tells you, guess what? It's now somewhere else. So it's, we're gonna all have that. But we also are all gonna have the right hand side of the page and that even in the worst time of it, that we can preserve our spiritual freedom. That was something that I'm sure many of you had read Viktor Frankl's work, Man's Search for Meeting. So he was in a concentration camp. And that's what he writes about. I mean, anything that we experience is not going to be worse than that. 
And yet, he said, I'm, I can pr- preserve my spiritual freedom. I have the choice on how I'm going to respond to these things that are happening, and therefore I'm free. And that makes me feel good, too, when, I'm, when I feel like I'm trapped or I'm working with somebody who it's just, you know, awful. I think, no, there, there still is that freedom and there still is that ability to not only identify through gratitude what's on the right-hand side of the page, but to, you know, tell people about it and to, you know, and then that's infectious. And then physiologically, by emphasizing, I just read a new article and... Um, it was it basically it's sort of almost like muscle memory in your brain that when you're putting out positive thoughts and framing things in a certain way, it, you're more likely to then start going that way naturally because you're remembering having done it. So the same thing happens to two people and one person frames it completely differently than another. I had two grandmothers and my mom's mom was named Charlotte, and you could say the worst thing in the world, and she would feel, oh, well, that was lucky, because if we hadn't run out of gas, we, I mean, you just amazing the ability to really frame things in a way, whereas Edda, my mom's stepmom, my dad's stepmom, she could take the best thing in the world, and it was always right, something really brutal that was really a result of it. And they had the same socioeconomic status. They had very similar health conditions. They lived the same length of life. And yet, just the very name in our household of Charlotte versus Edda, you know, it's like almost like a physical response that we all have. And the action that people are having to you and how much you can help by being who you are. And I can see, obviously, in this group, you are already doing that. Okay, so faith. Okay, this is, sorry, I got mixed up. This is where I was going to talk about the folded page exercise about in the faith part of it. But there is a lot of research that shows that there is not only increased um, quality of life as a result of faith, but that um, uh, there's increased lifespan as a result of faith. And so they hold all these other variables constant and still um, there's longer and better life as a result of faith. And so I always think that's really encouraging and fortunate. So now let's talk about your legacy because what I'm hoping is that I would stop talking in about um, five minutes or so and then we'd have some time for questions because I always learn more than I ever teach um, by people who are in it and tell me what works and what doesn't work or calling me out on stuff. <laughs> I really have had wonderful um, opportunities. I was recently in San Diego, and everybody in the room of 100 was 90 and older. I, it was like the greatest day ever. So at the end, I said, is there anything I said that was just wrong? And this one guy said, yes. And I go, OK. Oh, what, what was it? And she said, well, in the beginning there, when you were saying about how um, aging can be very hard, and I said, yes, and she goes, well, I don't find it hard at all. And I was like, okay, I stand corrected. It is not necessarily hard for every single person, but I just think it can be tough for the majority of us. Does anyone here think, like, this is, you know, what's the big deal? This is not that hard so far. Okay. <laughs> Yay! Well, I have the woman for you. No. <laughs> and she's sitting right next to you. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about legacy. Um, I think I brought it up here. The greatest thing, yeah, you're looking at what I'm looking at. The, one of the greatest things um, was I got this blank book at, you can get them anywhere. I happened to get it at Barnes & Noble. And I gave one to my mom, and one to my dad, and one to my father-in-law, and one to my mother-in-law. And I did, and this was quite some time ago when they were young. They were like 60 or something. And I, they were so young. <laughs> and um, I just said, write whatever you want in these books. But it's going to be a big deal someday. Don't put too much pressure on it. Just write. So my and then I kind of forgot about it because you know you're having babies and living your life and so when my dad passed away 
just his writing is just precious to us. So all 30 of us made copies of it. And it didn't matter what it said. It was just the, the thought. And one thing that he did, he wrote, he, he has um, 12 grandkids. And so he went with each of the grandkids. And at the time, like my kids, for example, were only like two and two months or something. So he went and did it anyway. So he, he'd say, you know, this 15-year-old, you know, Lee, he's, he's real entrepreneurial. I can see him. And it was all just good stuff. And it wasn't necessarily accurate. But it made every single one of the kids and grandkids, even the two-month-old, feel like, oh, he knew me. That was beautiful. <laughs> and the other thing that he did, he wrote about his childhood. And he wasn't... It was, and then some days he's just like, I'm just mad. I'm mad at your mom tonight because blah, blah, whatever. But that was still precious too. So I went to my mom, who is an amazing 83-year-old, and I said, um, how's your book coming? And it was entirely blank. <laughs> she goes, well, I want it to be really good, so I'm really just mapping it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, should I decorate it? Should I put pictures? I just wasn't sure. And I said, Mom, you know, Dad's death was sudden, and yours could be too, so get going on here. So, so she didn't. And so I was visiting one day, and she wasn't home. And so on the first page, I wrote in pencil, please write a recipe right here. And so the next time I came, I didn't say anything about it. And the next time I came, there was a recipe. And again, her beautiful school teacher writing and it was like, that is so precious to me. And so when I told her, I said, I looked in your book and I saw that you wrote a recipe. Write some more stuff, write anything. Well, she, I'm happy to say, has just finished her book. And she just wrote any possible things. You know, she'll say, you know, one of the, the page said, the mother sets the tone. She's like, if the mom is crabby, everybody's crabby. If the mom is uptight, everybody's uptight. She's like, so you need to make mama happy, and then everybody will be happy. <laughs> and I was so happy, because that's just how our house is. You know? So it, you just write anything. And if you put pressure on it, it's not going to happen. But just think how you would feel seeing your mom's writing or your dad's writing. And then maybe some of you think, I don't have kids. Who's going to look at my book? You do. You have friends and neighbors, and the process of it is creative and, and, and enjoyable, too. So when I give small talks, I give everybody one of these, but I couldn't do it today. But if I could, I would be passing these under your seat. There's a book like this. <laughs> There's really not. So <laughs> you just have to go and buy this. And if... And if you um, also, like if you have parents or loved ones, you could give it to them too. You can, like you students back there, you can, or I know you're not a student, you're done with school, but um, give it to your parents and then you'd have a set. So my goal is I'd have a set of everybody's books. Okay, so have I consoled you? You're gonna go get a book? Okay, I can move on. Okay, so the other thing that you're giving is your time. Your legacy is just your time. And I think because society has caused us to undervalue ourselves, that we sometimes misperceive ourselves as a burden as opposed to the blessing that we are. I had an older adult who, she was in her, I think, late 90s, and she lived next door to me, and she was not connected with any of her kids. And I had three little kids, and I would have given anything if somebody would come over at dinner time and hold those darn squirmy kids. But... She, she would never take me up on it. Like, oh, I know that you're busy. And I couldn't convince her. Like, won't you please come over and help me? Because I would enjoy to have a, a grown-up to talk to. And so I think just, just to remember that you are not a burden, you're a blessing, and that you know, by offering yourself and your time, you're going to enrich um, other people's lives. Okay, the next piece of legacy that you can give is for something that we talked about in the beginning. You have advanced directives, so you feel like, okay, I can check it. I'm good. I know. I got advanced directives. Here's how it happened with my dad. He lives in San Capistrano, and he was with another couple, and he, they were driving to the movie. No, they went driving from the movie. They had gone to the movie, coming back, and he wasn't feeling very great, but he you know, got to their house, 
the other couple had made dinner and they were toasting. And so my dad was giving a toast and he was you know, saying something funny. And then he started saying words that were kind of like, what? And so luckily, first my mom was just like, John, what? But luckily the other woman was a nurse and she said, you know something, we're not that close to, to mission, not that far from mission, let's go to mission hospital. So they got in the car and they called me and then I called everybody and before we knew it, we had a million people at mission hospital. And my dad walked in just fine, but what had happened is he'd had a brain hemorrhage when he was driving home. And it was um, bilateral bleed, and he was on Coumadin, as many of us are after heart. And because of that, it just bled. So it was damaging his brain as we talked. And he had an advanced directive. And the physician, um, the neurologist, really super busy, and he came in there, and he said, like, you know, did anticoagulant, did all this stuff. He's just going to save him, save him, save him. And so we, who love him so much, like, great, okay, this is great, he's going to be okay, right? So we're doing all this stuff, and just by God's grace, there was an internal medicine physician who was there, and he came over, he said, um, I've seen the x-ray, and I'm really sorry for your dad, and I'm sorry. And I said, now, I said, wow, is that bad? And he said, well, if this was my father, you know, I... It, I really want to think that, make sure that I was adhering to his wishes. I was like, whoa, okay, wait. My dad was so clear that he did not want to live in a way that was just, you know, sustained um, artificially. And he not only told me, but he told all my brothers and sisters. And so I stopped dead in my tracks. And by this time, it was the middle of the night. I called our family physician, so you should be able to call. And I said, let me tell you about this bleed. And they're all like, will not speak again, will be incontinent, will be, and they were going, everything that was, for him, exactly what he didn't want. I mean, this guy didn't even like to go out if his hair was messed up, you know? <laughs> so, um, and we were able to, as a family, sit, talk about this, and talk about the option of comfort care, and talk about all this thing, and because of that, we all felt like, oh, as hard as it was, we're doing what you wanted. But I think so many families are wringing their hands and they can have, an, like, the, that neurologist was, well, I could, I could make him live. And, he, you know, he was actually mean about it, mean about adhering to my dad's wishes. And so I wrote a note to the hospital and everything because I didn't want it to happen to other families because it's hard enough as it is. So it's just important to have these conversations that you can give the gift of your kids and your spouse knowing that we're doing what you want. And for everybody, it's going to be different. But if you only write it down, they didn't look at it that night in the hospital. And if you only tell one kid, then those other kids, especially the ones who live farther away and they want a little bit more time with you, are just going to keep you know, doing everything that they can and arguing with the one, with the one who said, well, actually, you know, mom said this. Well, I never heard her say that. So have those conversations. And when your family goes, you're fine. Why are you saying this? You crazy don't. You're fine. You know, we don't need to talk about this. Go, I know I'm fine. I'm planning on being here for a long time. But there is going to come a time when I'm not. And I want you to know. And I'm going to tell your brother the same thing. And I'm going to tell my sister and my aunt and all these kinds of things. Because it is a gift. It's one of the greatest gifts that I have is that we did what he wanted. And that he, you know, he, did, he didn't have all the suffering. So now um, I'm going to end my last couple of minutes by talking a little bit more about elder abuse because I can't help myself. So I've been at UCI for about, yeah, that doesn't look too good. Okay. So um, I've been at UCI for 14 years on their faculty in the medical school. And what was happening is that stuff was coming across our desk that was horrible. And they, uh, you know, the district attorney or law enforcement would say, hey, doc, can you take a look at this? You get into these cases, and you go, what is going on here? You know, there was a handprint bruise. There was a latex glove lodged in someone's throat. There was a woman covered with cigarette burns. There was a man with maggots in his back. And you go, what is happening? So we, we, we learned, like I said earlier, that there are 800 reports of elder abuse every month in Orange County. So nationally, there's about 5 million older adults. So what we did is we connected with um, medicine, with social services, 
and we created a medical response team. So we had physicians going into the home, and that was really helpful. But it wasn't enough because then we would identify a perpetrator, and we don't know law enforcement or the DA, so we didn't know how to. So the next step was to create a elder abuse forensic center. So we meet every Tuesday in Santa Ana with a group, and we're able to, like when you have everybody saying and the DA there, we're able to really make progress on these cases. And the penal code is 368. It covers not only adults over 65, but also adults with developmental disabilities. So we're finding that almost like half our cases are younger adults with developmental disabilities. Um, so I want you in your legacy to decrease your odds of this happening because I am convinced that any of us can be a victim and any of us can be a perpetrator. This is controversial because in the domestic violence community they say that it is, to say that anybody can be a perpetrator is minimizing it. But I have seen people who, you know, it isn't that they started out on this path. There are also people who are absolutely, you know, doing the scams and they're going to go from victim to victim to victim. Have any of you gotten this call where they're like, hi, Grandma? And you go, hi, Robbie. And then he knows that your grandson's name is Robbie because you just said, hi, Robbie. And then they'll say, oh, gosh, Grandma, don't tell my mom, but it's just awful. I didn't have any pot, but my friend did. And so now I'm in jail, and they said that if we would wire a thousand dollars, I'd be able to get out, and then I'm going to make it all right. Uh, and I've had so many smart, educated, lovely people do this for Robbie. And it's you know it happened when I was at my mom's house. Somebody called and said, "Hi, Grandma." And as soon as she said, "Who is this?" I like went running. Hello, click, and they and they hung up. And people are just realizing that people have money and they're just going after it. The kinds of abuse are financial, physical, neglect, sexual, and psychological. And in the beginning I thought, oh, psychological maybe, at least it was just psychological. It can be every bit as debilitating. So you'll say, you will never see your grandkids again. You don't do what I want, you're going to a nursing home. I mean, it can be absolutely paralyzing. So for you, make sure you plan ahead recognizing in every family that ever exists there's going to be dynamics and so imagine okay these this is how the kids that I trust I'm going to talk about these kinds of things um, and really important to stay connected and we talked about that know the signs and some of the signs like unusual bruising and bruising at various stages of healing we did a study and that was funded by the Department of Justice and what we found was, although color dating is not practical, it is not location is. So in the absence of abuse, you will find, so if it's just regular things on your arms and legs, but at the forensic center, all the time we're seeing neck, ears, bottom of the feet, and genitals. And we did not see those in re regular bruising. So thinking about the location of bruising, Inconsistent stories is a lot. I had a case recently where again it was uh, on the wrist, and the adult son said she fell, and so then the mother said, "Yes, I fell." And you just see this handprint right here. So I said, "Could you demonstrate to me how this happened?" Well, you know, th it, there was no way that you could demonstrate it to make it like that. Okay, um, bed sores that are not attended to, filth, not a normal part of aging. If you see something, these are signs. We had a woman recently who had worn the same bra for so long that her skin grew over it and we had to use a scalpel to take off her bra. Mm. Um, fear, if somebody is fearful, even if they have dementia, it's something to look into. People would say to me, I know, they, I know that these folks have dementia, so how, can, how do I know if I believe them or not? If they start on the side of believing them, start on really listening. Then if you're proven wrong, great, but at least you've looked into it. Because one of the greatest risk factors is dementia. And then also look at unusual expenditures or a change in spending habits. We had a, a really pretty wealthy family and they had their mom move in with her and they were charging $500 a month to rent a room. You know, it's not a crime. It's not that nice, but it's not a crime. But because she was confused, they had her pay a rent check every day. 
so this little daughter-in-law in her nice Newport home would go, okay, um, okay, mom, it's time for rent. And so what a dodo, because we had all those studs. It was like, done, in that case, <laughs> that was pretty easy. Um, but the fact that it exists, you know, that we need to, just as we couldn't believe that child abuse exists, just as we didn't understand the depths of domestic violence, we haven't quite understood, you know, um, the extent of this national shame. Also, the last thing about getting help. What do you do if you suspect abuse? First of all, you don't have to know for sure. So let's say you're worried about your next door neighbor, her adult children, you think, oh, I don't know about this. Um, you would call Adult Protective Services. And Adult Protective Services is social workers, and they don't, it's not like they come in and make things happen. They just come in and investigate into it. If it's something, I'd also really encourage you to call law enforcement. We work closely with law enforcement, and they'll say, well, we don't, we don't think it's that big of a problem because we don't get that many cases. And yet here I know that it's going on all around us. So if we increase visibility by calling, and um, if you're wrong about it, that, you know, that's okay. Um, people say, I don't want to unjustly accuse someone, and I don't either. Having said that, you look into it. If somebody's doing just a fine job, you know, it usually is quite the, the other way. We had a woman who, she was nonverbal, and uh, the bed had broken down as a result of urine, and the box spring lodged in her back, and she couldn't talk about it. So this family is just having her in excruciating pain, and she, she was um, grimacing and wincing. And so when we lifted her up, the family said, oh, we didn't know that. As if like, oh, you know, I think, what? Right here in our back door. And so on my way to work every day, I think, how many cases am I just driving by that will never come to the surface? Because when children die, it does put up a flag, but when older adults die, Sometimes I think we just miss it all together. Um, now, if somebody's in a nursing home, every nursing home is associated with a long-term care ombudsman program. So you would contact the ombudsman, and they can help you um, look into what's going on. And they are there's a new um, law that requires them also reporting to law enforcement. So that was good. And um, in Orange County, we have um, we started doing this, and then we became the center of excellence on elder abuse and neglect. And then our greatest thing is because we were really in the trenches doing it, the federal government just this year made us the national center on elder abuse. Orange County is the national center on elder abuse. And because of that, it's been, suddenly you get a lot of doors open when you're the national center on elder abuse. And that's ha what happened about this Dr. Phil business. But it hasn't aired yet. So I'll, try, I'll, I'll tell Dr. Rose when it airs, they taped it and they said they'd never done anything on elder abuse and they weren't sure that it's pretty distasteful so their demographic might not like it. And I'm like, okay. So, so, so could I try to like gear it toward not the older adult but about the adult children, like how hard it is on the adult children. So, but um, they taped it but it hasn't aired. So I'm just hopeful that it's going to air. And I, I call a lot, like, so when's that going to be on? Because when domestic violence was on that program, they got 25,000 calls the next day on the 1-800 domestic violence hotline. So we have like our hotline all ready to go and try to, but uh, so far it's not airing. And then the last thing, I really am almost done. The last thing is we created something called Ageless Alliance. It's a social justice movement that's trying to unite people of all ages against elder abuse. So we have a website, we created a, PA, a public service announcement, and they showed that on the Dr. Phil segment, and they also showed it at the White House at an event recently. And so it's just a way to, on the ground floor, to try to get involved to say, this is, exists and is unacceptable to us as a society, that we are not going to tolerate it. And um, there's a lot of real positive w things that people are starting to volunteer to do. But because it's so new, you can make a really big impact if you wanted to. So you could, you could go onto that website and you can join. And then we, have, we just have bumper stickers and bracelets. We're going to have a, um, a share your story part to it. We're going to have um, I don't know, oh, a lot of cool stuff. So now I will stop. Are there any questions? Yes. How do we call Dr. Phil? How do we call Dr. Phil?